We are very lucky today to have Anita Manuel from the Career Center here who's going to talk about networking. Um, and if you are in COM 80, uh, there's a sign-up sheet going around. If you're in 199C and COM 80, yes, it counts for both. Um, and this is your post work for that. Uh, so the sign-up sheet will be going around. Uh, I think without further ado, we've got about an hour uh, with Anita. And so take notes. Feel free to ask questions. And come 199C students, I'll see you next. I'll be here, but I'll see you next week back in our regular classroom. Cool. Thank you.
And because there's so many social networks, a common question I get is, well, what should I even focus on? Because, I mean, there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's LinkedIn, uh, there's YouTube, and so I'm not sure where I should focus my energies. And so this is actually um, good information from the same survey, breaking down what networks employers tend to use specifically for recruiting purposes. And not surprisingly, 94% of them, all of them, almost are using LinkedIn primarily for recruiting purposes. So what does that mean for you? You should at least all have a profile on LinkedIn if you want to be discovered by a recruiter or a hiring manager. And there's a couple reasons for that. Why do you think that organizations might be using more social related networks for hiring than ever before? Time and cost savings. Yeah. Yeah, how do you see that that may be a time and cost savings there? Because everyone's at their computer already. They can just connect in, sort on certain things. You know, my profile, I've, I've recently upgraded to the professional, and it allows you to see sort of what range you would be if you were applying for a job. So they can literally, from their end, pick the top 10% of right. candidates that are likely to fit what they need. Right. Any other ideas on why this is like a preferred method not for recruiters? So social media, social basically meaning sharing with other people is primarily really organic and can grow very quickly without a lot of effort. And media, meaning that you can showcase your skills and your experiences and your projects versus telling someone. So the typical paper resume, you know, if I'm a, a recruiter and I post a position, I could get hundreds and hundreds of those on a posting that I would have to go through. Or I could go to a LinkedIn or, you know, Google someone's name and maybe see a picture, examples of their projects. If you did a PowerPoint presentation, you may already have that uploaded on your profile. And I can get a lot more information about how you've actually applied your skills in visible, in visible examples versus just reading some content on a piece of paper. <coughs> and what's more interesting, looking at people's pictures and videos or looking at a piece of paper? People tend to like to that <coughs> visual thing, so they're going to be more drawn to any visual representations that you have of yourself online. And then the other channels, you know, Facebook is increasing. Um, a lot of companies and groups have, you know, their own company pages on Facebook now, mostly to increase their branding awareness with consumers. But they also do a lot of recruiting as far as posting internships and jobs related to specific areas. So if there are companies or organizations that you're targeting, I would definitely also just do a search for them on Facebook to see if they have certain pages that really talk more about their culture, what they're looking for. Um, Cisco has really great Facebook pages where they actually talk about <coughs> consumer and client problems and open it up if anyone has solutions for those things. So that's information that's very targeted to a certain organization that you're not necessarily going to get from their website and reading their mission and values. Are any of you um, using Twitter or have blogs that you write? Okay, those are other areas to, to consider too. We won't get into too much depth there, given time, but we will focus primarily on LinkedIn. So the other piece is, okay, so if a recruiter are going online and they're looking at this information, what specifically is influencing their decision making and what you know makes an impact on them? And whether we agree with it or not, and it's fair that someone can kind of Google your profile or if you don't set your privacy settings on Facebook if someone can see what you post, the fact of the matter is that 93% of recruiters say that they're going to look at your profile. <coughs> so if you do apply for a position, you can probably bet that they're either going to Google your name or look you up on LinkedIn pretty quickly. Um, and so the things that really make a difference to them is, you know, the things that you would think would be negative. So what we want to do is avoid anything that would be negative association with your brand. Profanity, grammatical errors, um, inappropriate tweets, um, anything posted in the sexual nature, references to you know illegal drugs, things like that, all of those things tend to be uh, seen as negative by a recruiter or could change their view of whether or not they want to bring you in for an interview. That's not surprising. But you could also use some of the profile features to highlight things that they actually look at in a positive light. Volunteer work is a big one. So I've uh, personally heard a lot of recruiters say that they specifically will do some searches on volunteer work because that's something that they value within their culture and their work environment. So if you have that listed or pictures of you doing volunteer work or outreach, that's something that tends to be pretty positive. Uh, anything that highlights your skill sets obviously is going to be positive. 
So what we want you to do is, before <laughs> developing your brand, is avoid any negative messaging, right? This is an actual post of this poor guy. Um, it, was, it was featured on Career Builder several years ago, but this was on his Facebook page, and, and now he just immortalizes what not to do <laughs> online. But again, you know, posting inappropriate pictures, uh, bad-mouthing former employers. Mm -hmm. This is a big one that's come up um, more recently, too, because we are very social, right, on social networks. We give our opinion. We like to rate things. We like to say, you know, give a review on restaurants and things, and that's fine. But remember, when you're in that job search or internship search um, mode, that an employer is really going to look closely to your history and whether or not you have you know, said something negative about a former employer, would you do that in our organization as well? So again, making sure that you know what you start um, commenting on is fairly neutral and don't necessarily bad about all employers. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm much more into having discussion than like just lecturing at you. Some of the strategies I've heard people use it and they get into that job search mode is that um, instead, you know, probably cleaning up your profile, but instead of that, you just shut down. You turn off your Facebook, you turn off your Twitter, you turn things off so that you just your face out there, that the resume is and such, um, and maybe your, your LinkedIn. But what is your opinion on, on people just, just shutting it all down until you get that job and you start it all up again? I think it depends what you're looking for. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, social media is actually a great thing, right? It's a way to expand your network and also connect with people that you may have not even known existed. So, for example, with Twitter, I wouldn't necessarily shut down a Twitter feed because it's such a great research resource. Um, what I would just do is just make sure you clean up your privacy settings. All of these sites have very specific privacy settings. So really going through there and, you know, blocking certain things, making sure that you can't have friends tag you in pictures, that's a big one. So if you don't update those, those privacy settings, maybe you, you kind of update everything else, but you don't do the feature where friends can tag you in pictures, the next thing you know they tag you, yeah. like, you know, the night before at the bar, and you're like, I just adjusted my privacy settings. And the other thing is just to make sure that, um, that the messaging that you put out is professional, right? Facebook's great because there are a lot, I mean, Facebook tends to be the people that know you and like you and are your friends, right? So they're more, most likely to help you out if you even put a question out to your community saying, I would love an internship with Apple. Does anyone have any hookups in this area? And you might get more response more quickly from your Facebook feed than you might from some of your other contacts. Okay. Uh, it kind of goes off what he was saying about um, Facebook and what you're saying about privacy settings. If you have your Facebook on the most private that I'm aware of, is basically if someone searches you up, it's just your cover photo and your profile picture and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that's a pro or con so they can find you but they can't see anything that you posted or anything or anything like that? Is that good, bad, neutral, like I think you see you're there, but now we can't tell. Are you hiding something? I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's a pro. I think okay. people realize that Facebook is primarily a social network. Yeah. Um, so employers, you know, if, if, if it's not set to privacy and I Google you and it comes up, I'm going to look at it, yeah. right? But if it's already kind of, you know, oh, that's just how you look and that you exist on Facebook, then I'm probably going to rely just on LinkedIn. One. Remember, because yeah. LinkedIn is the number one, yeah. so I'm going to go there. But again, if someone Googles you and that pops up, they're going to check it out. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Cool. So for you guys, poor communication skills, right? Want to avoid that. And that comes out with a lot of the written pieces. And you know, there's a lot of debate because employers are really complaining that the number one skill that they can't hire for is communication skills both written and verbal. They're so poor. You know, new graduates can't write. They can't give presentations. Or um, they're using a lot of jargon and text speak, and that's not going to work for my clients. And so for you guys, just remembering, you know, it's, it's difficult. Like, if Twitter only allows you 140 characters. So you do have to do very concise messaging. And that's fine, but remembering that they're going to look at your communication skills, how you write, and I've even had employers say that they like looking at people's Twitter feeds, especially for comm majors, to see if you can develop concise messages. Mm -hmm. So what can you say in 140 words? So if I'm going for a marketing position and I need to market um, a product really quickly or do a new announcement, can I put something together that's catchy in 140 words or less? Right? So 
looking at the, your ability to make concise messaging is something that employers will look at too. So if I were a comm major, I probably would have a Twitter feed just to ensure that I'm tweeting about things that I'm excited or interested about, but also to show that I can do concise messaging if I needed to. How many of you are interested in using your comm degrees in marketing? Oh, yeah, okay. So definitely that would be something to consider. Okay, and just don't lie. <laughs> so lying about qualifications. Now it's, it's so much easier to get information about people that maybe you traditionally wouldn't want someone to know about. An example of this is someone putting that, um, that they, for, um, it was on a Twitter feed, that they had applied for a position at Cisco, were offered the job, but then said that they were going to accept it, but they're actually not because they're holding out for another position. And that was a tweet that they just put out to their you know, group. Well, the recruiter who happened to be following the candidates actually saw that tweet and that was that offer was reneged for that candidate. Because like, well, why am I going to do the offer if they're already telling the world that they might renege and do another offer? So just making sure that you know you make a commitment to someone or say something that you're not necessarily contradicting yourself on social networks. Okay, but the important part is using these these methods of marketing. Mark yourself, right? Brand yourself. So there's a lot of discussion on what's your brand. So if I were to ask you, you know, what's your brand? What are the top three keywords that you're associated with? Could you come up with that? Um, some people are like, okay, I know my top three skills. I know what you know my top three um, keywords would be. And some of you are like, I really have to think about that. But the reason why I think that the top three keywords are important is because that's what employers are doing when they go online, especially on LinkedIn. They're just typing in the top keywords that they're looking for and then see which profiles come up for those keywords. So you really want to know what your, your areas of expertise are going to be and what you want to be associated with. And so that's what we kind of call a brand statement. And ways to kind of get you thinking about that, you want to think, you know, what are unique traits or experiences to you? So if everyone's graduating with the same degree and everyone did the same project, what's different about your perspective or how you approach those things that are unique to you? Definitely go with your strengths. You know, a lot of interview questions are what are your strengths or your top three strengths as it relates to this position. So being able to kind of just skew that out and having those keywords start to <coughs> in all of your profiles. And again, what are the keywords that you'd like to be identified with? What are your key accomplishments? So if someone were to ask you, you know, what, what are some of the things that you've accomplished while you're at SJSU, or what are the top three projects you're most proud of? Can you identify those? And then the next step is, do you have examples of those? Because on social media, you can upload just about anything and exemplify what you've accomplished. And if you're still stuck, think about what you're most proud of. And then where can you develop an expertise? And this is a really great way of growing your network, uh, especially on LinkedIn. There's a lot of discussion going on in subgroups based on interest area and people asking very specific questions. So if it was related to comm, it could be, you know, how do I put together a press release? Or if I have to do an organic marketing campaign, how would I get that started? And people can just kind of give feedback and answers. But once you start developing an expertise or giving feedback on certain topics, people start wanting to get to know you or connect with you. So knowing what your niche is going to be or what your expertise is is really important too. It can help you stand out. And then it's just remember, you know, what are your goals? Are you looking for an internship? Are you looking for a job? Are you wanting to just research some different career opportunities? But whatever your goal is, is really going to help determine how you want to use your brand, how you want to market yourself. So let's look at an example. What I, I, you know, I determine what my keywords are. So how does this brand look in real life? So this is um, an example of a student LinkedIn profile. And so one area that you want to use those keywords, and it can be as easy as your major, is under your main and your introductory title line. So this person says he's an econ major and an aspiring financial analyst. So even if I just scrolled on this very quickly, I would know right away what this person is looking for. And then you also want to include some of those keywords in your summary. Okay, so what motivates you? What have you skilled at? And what do you want to do? And those things right away will tell a recruiter, an employer, whether or not that's something that matches with what they're seeking. Also, when they do keyword searches, 
it goes through these two sections first. Okay, so they include your education, and it is important to fill it out completely, or you won't show up in searches. We'll talk a little bit about that. So does everyone's profile look like this? Totally. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Okay. So you get on LinkedIn, your profile's awesome, you got your keywords, <coughs> and then who are you going to connect with? And I think a lot of people get stuck here because they say they don't know anyone. And the truth is, you do have an inner circle that you can start with. And your friends and family should definitely be the people that you start with. Because most of them are employed, most of them are connected with a certain industry or job, and they have connections as well. And hopefully they like you and want to help you out. <laughs> so this is a place to start, right? Because friends and family are going to, you know, if you put that out there, are going to want to support whatever it is that you're looking for. After you kind of connect with friends and family, then you want to think about the next circle, which is your peers, all of you together here. Okay, you guys all have jobs or internships or connections and have a common interest, so are probably open to helping each other out. So sharing that information with each other is important. And then alumni. And the reason that's big and bold is because I think that's the number one connection outside of school and family that's going to help you out. So. Alumni groups, and I'll talk about, there's tons of SJCU alumni groups, and there's specific groups for COM. Are all of you on the COM group for LinkedIn? Did you know there was a COM group for LinkedIn? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so we'll show you that too. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, why are alumni so important to okay. That's a very good question. Why do you guys think alumni would be so important? <laughs> Association is the is a branch of the National Communication Association. Uh, it's pretty cheap for students to join. 
Um, but I think that in our field, it actually is more kind of specialized in terms of whether you're in environmental communication yeah. or something. But I think, I know some students, maybe not in this class, are in the P, there's a PR. PRSA. Yeah, yeah. PR, yeah. And, um, and that might be something for those of you that want to go um, into marketing. But I guarantee you, each niche area is going to have their professional association. Yeah. The other piece to that, too, is if you don't have a lot of experience yet in your area, <coughs> the professional association's office often will sponsor either like um, research opportunities or opportunities to partner with someone on a project. So that is another opportunity to get experience before you graduate and then on your resume. Okay, and the last one, which is not important, it's just the hardest one to get into, is if I were to ask you, who are your top ten employers? Do you have a top ten list of who you'd ideally want to work with? It would be great to have that in line before you graduate. You know, if I'm talking to someone or I want to research ten companies that are going to be my ideal, you know, who are those top ten? And then start doing outreach and networking within those groups. Because there's hundreds and hundreds of employers, but there's probably one or two that you really, really are interested in. So why not start your networking, trying to get in with people who work there versus you know a company that you're not in. And I'm sure you've all heard this before, most positions are found through networking, not through job posting sites. So how many of you have been hooked up with a job by a friend or a referral? Yeah, most of us. And the thing is, when it's time to hire, the first thing that hiring managers do will go to their own team. Do you guys know anyone who can fill this position? You know, if you guys know someone, I like you, we already have a team, and most likely they're going to be cool just like you, and we can bring them in, that saves me a whole hiring cycle. Um, you know, if you're a big company like Google, Facebook, then they give like major bonuses for referrals, so employees want to refer because they get you know an extra couple thousand dollars to do that. So again, it, it does pay to you know network so that you can get those leads before a job posting goes up. Because by the time a job posting goes up, an employer has exhausted all their other opportunities, and your competition pool is pretty big. So I think the networking piece really helps to narrow down your competition pool. Um. So with everything being so social media based, when I first moved here, I went to a couple of Chamber of Commerce functions. Mm -hmm. It didn't really pan out, but do you think that's so antiquated that just leave that alone, or is that still worthwhile if you have a focus? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, if we're going to get into the importance of face-to-face, -face, that still counts. Um, social networking is a great way to start a relationship, but by no means does it actually seal the deal. You still have to come in for an interview. Um, so the ability to kind of connect with people and develop relationships in real time is still very important. So I would still go to chamber meetings and things like that as long as it's related to kind of getting you in front of the right people. And I think that's the key. So maybe using social media to research who those right people are and then find out where they hang out and then show up, right? Because what you're doing is creating opportunities for yourself to meet with people. Right? So what are you, what's your interest area? Media. Okay. Like uh, video production, education, things like that. Okay. okay. And so, yeah, so, so there's chamber meetings where maybe they're looking for assistance. So that's the other thing, pitching <coughs> your abilities to a group of people who may need it, right? So I actually would need someone to help me produce videos for the Career Center website. So if we had networked at a certain place, it's like, oh, that's cool, tell me more about video production. But So people have needs even outside of your scope, but it's that idea of, well, let me let, let you know what problems I can solve. So that would, should be one of your keywords in your brand. Yeah. Okay, easy question, where would you like your resume? Like, yes. not in this step, right? <laughs> um, so again, let's, let's just back to the referral piece. Like, most of the, the yeses get handed to someone. They don't even get in that stack. It's like, oh, this is a person you should check out. Or here's a person that you I, I think would be great for this position. You should at least talk to them. And then they'll get a call and say, you need to apply for this position, and I'll check out for your resume when it comes in. Okay. That's what you want, ideally. And you guys are comm students. So I'm assuming that the idea of persuasion or the ability to persuade is kind of in there. It's not naturally in there. It's being trained into you. So you're going to have a leg up anyway on knowing how to kind of introduce yourself and um, communicate what you can offer. All right, LinkedIn. Are you LinkedIn? So I already told you that you know most recruiters are using this, but also LinkedIn has some pretty big stats and numbers. The three million plus companies are on it. There's more than two. This number has already changed. Like 250 million professionals. And also, if you're looking at working outside the U.S., LinkedIn is good too because they have a global presence as well. 
Um, some of the groups that I belong to are actually international groups, and a lot of job leads and tips come through those groups as well that I wouldn't typically get information on. Okay. And if, if there is a company on your top 10 list, I can probably guarantee that they're going to have a presence or a page on LinkedIn. So every five, Fortune 500 company is represented on there. Every recruiter on our last um, grad blast panel, so every year we invite employers to come in and speak to new graduates about their best tips for success after graduation. Every single one of them, there was eight on the panel, all use LinkedIn to actively recruit. And two of them actually made direct hires from that. So it is something that, again, you should probably be on or have a <coughs> So these are my top eight tips. Okay, if you do these things, then you will most likely have your profile filled out 100%. percent you probably search up uh, comp and searches. And you'll be using the functionality as well so that you'll get information. Um, so the number one thing is fill out your um, profile 100%. And it will tell you as you're filling it out what percentage you're at. The reason this is important is you won't come up in searches unless it's 100% filled out. So if you leave off your photo, guess what? It's not 100%. You're not showing it in searches. So that's the number one easiest thing to do. Uh, we talked about how to develop your networks, so starting to reach out to different people in the groups. Um, we'll talk about the search functions, but you can search by people, you can search by companies, you can search by jobs, and even um, specific questions or answers. So if you had a question, how to find an internship in communication, you could post that in the Q&A, and I bet you there would probably be an answer or a question related to that. We talked about sharing knowledge, so if you can answer a question that someone has, that's really a great way to expose yourself to other people outside your network, and definitely use the, the applications that they have. So you could include a blog feed, you can um, do presentation sharing, and you know making sure that you upload those things is really important. Because again, if I'm an employer and I go to a profile and it's just kind of sparse and it doesn't have any examples, that doesn't really do much for me. But if you have some examples of your work, that definitely does. We talked about the keywords, and getting recommendations is really important. And so starting now, just talking to your professors, um, if they can write recommendations for you. I'm sure Anne Marie College would love to write 100 <laughs> points in recommendations. Um, when you do that, though, make sure you have a resume ready for your professor or whoever you ask for recommendations, because it helps them understand what your main areas of interest are and what to highlight for you. Can I make a comment on that? Yeah. The other part of that is letting us know what kind of job you're applying for. Um, and so that way we can, or what you want us to highlight, so that way we can connect the skills that we know that you have from our classes to the kinds of things you're doing. It can create a much stronger um, letter. And I just would also say, give people a bunch of time. So that's going to be my next point. Yeah, oh, great, so, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's really good. I mean, start now, because you know how busy everyone gets, and the semester gets rolling, and then, you know, the professor may get not just one request from you, but multiple requests for letters of rec. Some are for grad school, some are for jobs. So, you know, one student for me did a great thing. She put a little portfolio package for me with her request for her letter of recommendation with her resume and like a little mission statement of what she wanted and the job she wanted. So much easier to write a letter or, or even want to do a recommendation for that person versus someone saying, I need a letter of rec by tomorrow or I'm going for a job and I just updated my LinkedIn profile. Can you write something for me really quick? And then you can actually personalize your LinkedIn URL. And this is really great for resumes or if you're handing out business cards because it'll just be linkedin.com backslash your name okay, versus like some really, really long link that no one can memorize. And all you got to do to claim your own URL name is just um, set your profile to public. So when you're making your profile, it'll have a little option of private or public. So when you set it to public, you can then get your own domain name. Yes? That's you. Um, what? Is the difference between a public and a private? Like, if, it's, if your profile is private on LinkedIn, how are employers find you? They can't. They, they can't. Search. I mean, unless they're already in LinkedIn and do a search, um, you can still come up. But with beyond that, so people, let's say you wanted to connect with someone you don't know, they wouldn't necessarily be able to see your profile. At okay. All. Yeah. So would they have to be someone you're already yeah, you know, connected with um, within your network? So that would probably be horrible then to keep. Your, <coughs> I wouldn't really see well, a point to yeah. have a private yeah, like feature on LinkedIn, but, okay. but in order to get the personalized 
um, domain name, you do have to set it to public. But yeah. you're probably going to do that anyway, which is right. It would defeat the purpose if you just want to set it to private. Okay, here's the cool thing. There's over 100 LinkedIn groups dedicated to SJSC. Over 100 LinkedIn groups. There's probably more now since I developed this presentation. And they're broken down by departments, specialties, <coughs> or alumni. And these are open to all current students. So the first one you have to join, which I think you all of you are on, is the comm group. Do you guys know you have a comm group? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? No. no. Really? What are we doing? Oh. <laughs> Let's start with Com Central. <laughs> so, who runs the Com group here? So, Daniel, would you like to make a little. I would love. Can I go up front? Yeah. Is that okay, Anita? Mm -hmm. I, I hate to take no, the thunder. No, but. no. So we have a whole social media team. Timothy over here next to the wall is doing the he's doing the bulk of the Twitter feed right now. Timothy, raise your hand. We have a whole social media team. We're covering LinkedIn, <coughs> Twitter, Facebook, etc. We're trying to help give students like Timothy and myself some expertise in actually doing the work because this is some of the stuff that can go on your resume that can be done in be used and, and show as evidence that you've actually gone and done something. Go check the SJUSU com Twitter feed. I did that, right? <laughs> that, I mean, that's, that's no bullshit about it. It's just right there, you just go look at it. So there's that. Uh, the main thing you guys should start, you should all have an invitation from Com Central. We have our own central site where each week when you get that newsletter, there are links in there to Com Central. That's and that's sort of the central place. You'll see something about like the Panetta internship and we just give you a little blurb about it, and there's a link that will take you to the site that will give you all the detail, maybe even a flyer or something like that. So it's really key to start with Com Central because everything else we kind of point to that, so that's your central place to find stuff. You can just go there, find some other interesting stuff, but from a job perspective and from a social media standpoint, start with Com Central. If you have any questions about that, you can find me afterwards and I'll help you get connected. And Com Central is on your Canvas page, so you, that would be when you see all of your other courses, you'll also see Com Central, and so it funnels you there. And then you have a bunch of internships that Dr. Hart puts together, uh, that people from Intern Bound put together, and so it's a great place to start. And then that gets you linked in through the uh, LinkedIn page for SJC Com. Thanks. I'll next show it to. Yeah, every, every, week there's, every week there's a brand new internship, and we try our best to get them up first. If you're a Com major, you're going to see them first before a bunch of other people and other stuff at other sites, other schools. It goes to our Twitter feed, so that's global. Everyone can see it. You guys ought to get to Com Central first on Sundays, Sunday evenings, no later than. Those things will be there. They're, they're updated during the week, too. So Com Central is only available to Com students? No. No. Well, the invitation was sent to be a canvas to all Com majors and minors. Okay. Um, and so I guess you can request to be part of it. But it targets communication studies majors. Oh. But if you're if you're a, an engineering major and you see the tweet for something that's pointed to Com Central, they can click on that and they'll be able to right. see it. So the page is open to other people, that's but the cool. invitation, yeah, Craig. Is that Com Central? Box, and you would just click on the little side menu, and it'll give you the option for groups. That's what all those little people are groups. I typed in communications. That's it. Hit search, and then. There are over 9,000 results for groups related to all. So there's going to be something in there, a group in there for you or your interest area. So just some examples, you know, public relations and communications professional, they have over 2,000 members. Public relations and communications jobs, so that's just specific to jobs, so that would be interesting. If you want to do corporate comm, and the list goes on and on and on and on. But even just by that one search, you would hit your niche. Um, and the second piece is just when you're building your profile, so we're just using mine as an example. There are specific um, tabs that are really central for students. Because a lot of times students will fill out their profile and say, well, I don't have any experience to add, or I don't have, you know, any qualifications to add, so my profile looks really sparse. So I wanted to kind of let you know that there's a project section where you can add specific projects, upload any visuals that are related to the projects. You could probably even get a testimonial in there from your professor about how well you did on the project. That would be really cool. Uh, if you do assist with any research projects and you're included, you can list that under publications. Okay, test scores, I really don't know. <laughs> but if you wanted to do test scores, you could do that. Uh, courses are really important. Especially if you are looking for an internship or your first job, remember that keyword search? 
if you have those courses that are already related to those keywords, those count, and they pop you up in those searches. Uh, certifications, you may have done some outside work and have a certification, that's great. And then the volunteering in causes, again, that goes a long way, yes. So you just said something that I'm not sure I understood. Okay. The, the classes that I have yes. have certain words in them, and you're saying those keywords or those are going to connect with keywords up in my summary that help so, get me well, better visibility. The way they connect is if I'm a recruiter and I type in social media, com, bachelor's degree, and you have those words popping up anywhere in your profile, so if you add them in projects, those will start to show up in those searches. If you don't have them in your projects, then you're just you know short on keywords. So projects really help you highlight those keywords and those examples of how you're using those skills, unless you have a lot of real world experience where you're already talking about those, those key areas. Could you give some examples of projects, please? Yeah, so um, you guys could probably give me examples. Have you ever had to do a group presentation? And right now, you're filming this or taking, you know, recording this. OK, that's that could be a project. Uh, running the social media program and what that entails and how you started the marketing campaign, that could be a project. Um, did you have to write a research paper and analyze a certain topic and how it affects communications related to gender? That's a project. Um, what other projects have you ever done? Short films. Short films. Those should be on there as long as they're for um, <laughs> <it's> projects. <laughs> um, so when you put courses and also the projects, do you put it by semester basis? So once the new semester starts, do you kind of get rid of things or do you accumulate after a while or like after you had it on there for a year, it's like, okay, that was a little while ago, let's take it off? Yeah, I, I think the beauty of projects is that um, with LinkedIn, you can kind of keep that as a running list. Okay. You're probably not going to have 10 projects on there. But, you know, maybe your top three that you're most proud of and most relevant to what you want. And then also, of course, it should be good by semester like this semester, I'm taking this. Or is it anything that you've completed thus far? So yeah, all of your quality. <coughs> that are relevant. I wouldn't list everything you've oh, ever done, but just like, you know, I would say your top five or six courses that so are So the ones relevant. that kind of summarize your big yeah. interest. Exactly. <coughs> yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. All right. The second piece that's hard is making connections. Okay, so I don't know anyone and you want me to connect, so I'm just going <coughs> to, oh, this person looks cool and I'll hit, I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn. So how many of you have gotten just the generic connect message? And do you accept those? No. No. If I know them. If you know them. So students will send me, you know, I mean, I'm pretty popular. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> students will send me messages and it's just like, I'd like to connect with you. And if I know them, I just click yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's cool. So if you already have a relationship with them, then you'll accept it. But if you don't know them and you're just connecting with, like, this hiring manager at Cisco because they have these full internships and you have no connection to them, um, sending the generic message really does not. Because again, there's no context for like, okay, so why are you con connecting with me? You know, what do we have in common? Who are you? So if you are going to start making connections and sending out invites to people you don't know, just three things to remember. Just introduce yourself, who you are, that you're a student at SJSU, that you're a comm major, um, what you have in common. We're both in the same group. Um, you're an alum, and I really was interested learning more about your career path, but what is it that you have in common? There's a reason that you're doing an invite to them. So what is it that you guys have in common? Um, and then, you know, what it is that you're looking for, and thank you. I, you know, thank you for your time. I appreciate any feedback that you can give me. So many people forget that piece. And again, you know, this could be a potential great connection for you. So just doing those three things will help have people want to connect with you and extend your network for you. But this is one of our interns here, and he was really curious in doing an informational interview. And he went through the SJSU alumni group and saw a hiring manager um, with Nordstrom's. And so he wanted to connect with her. And this is just an example of the messaging that he did that I thought was really good. So the subject is really specific. SJSU student <coughs> is about human resources. Okay. And then really short to the point, hi, Cynthia, I'm a student at SJSU. I'm just in HR. I noticed you graduated from SJSU with an HR major, and you now work at Nordstrom's. I'm still trying to learn more about what HR professionals do, and I was wondering if you can tell me a little bit about what you do at Nordstrom's. <coughs> Thank you, and I appreciate your time. Short and sweet, but much more likely to have that connection because you're starting to build a relationship versus the generic, they'd like to add you to my you know, LinkedIn network. So how many of you send tailored messages when you join? Yeah. 
and she, oh, and she said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did that. Um, the other piece is if you just want to go directly to see what alumni exist for San Jose State University, they actually have a site tailored to just alumni. So you would just go to linkedin.com backslash alumni. This is really cool because you can pick your school and you can see exactly where all alumni are working, um, what they're doing, um, what they study, and you can search by specific skills. So if you wanted to, you could go in here, pick San Jose State University, um, go to the What They Studied page and pick Comp. And then it will show you all alumni in LinkedIn who went to SJSU who studied Comp. And then you can narrow it down even further by skills. So if it's like writing that you're interested in, or presentation, or research, then you can pick the skill that you would like, and then it will narrow that down even further to the specific people who have that skill and majored in your major at San Jose State University and then guess what? It'll tell you where they work. And then you can look at their profiles. I mean that's really, really great information. Even if you don't contact them, just to see where do people with con majors who use the skills end up working? What are their job titles? What are some things that I should think about as options for me when I graduate? Okay. So are any is this new to most of you or yeah. New? Okay. And then one last thing, and I'm not like a spokesperson for LinkedIn, but I think it has a lot of great features for students, is um, there, been, there were a lot of complaints to LinkedIn about, well, most of these you know, jobs and profiles are all for like high level people, CEOs and things, you know, there's not a lot of opportunities for networking for students. So they said, well, that's not true. And they developed this LinkedIn.com backslash student job site. So this is just LinkedIn posted positions for students. So it includes internships, as well as entry level jobs. And the cool thing about it is if you see a position that comes up, it'll connect directly to your LinkedIn profile and you can see which connections might already be um, connected to that position or a person who might work within that company. So you can even expand your network that way. So I'm gonna deviate away from LinkedIn now, but any questions on that or feeling pretty comfortable with it? Yeah? But what I want you to remember is that FaceTime is still important. So <laughs> don't just do this, okay? And we hear this a lot again from employers who say it. We are also like attached to our phones and we're constantly texting and like people wake up in the morning and they don't say good morning to like their spouse or partner anymore. They like take their phone to see what their latest speed is. Or, and part of that is that we're kind of losing this uh, emphasis on the importance of the relationship building, right? And the face to face time and the interpersonal communication. And so just a couple tips on when you take it to the next level and decide to network with people in person, what you should say or what you should do or what the, the different you know, strategies are to ensure that you're also using the in-person piece as well. Okay, so really networking, no, not scary, it's just about developing relationships, right? So these two are already networking. <laughs> It's kind of a na natural human behavior. You may not even realize that you're doing it every day, all the time. It's just that people get caught up in this fancy term networking, which means they have to do it in a very professional environment at a conference or something. But really, it's just talking to another person, making a new friend, saying hello. But networking usually is with a purpose. Right? You have some sort of purpose of something that you'd like to do or learn information about. And it's usually sharing resources or information with someone else. Okay. And what's important, it's really about genuine connection and honesty. So you're more apt to build your networks and maintain your relationships if people feel like you're trustworthy and they can, that you're genuine in your intentions. The minute that people kind of sniff out that maybe you're just talking to them because they're hiring for a job or you want a specific job or you need a favor, they tend to shut down. And you would be too, like why is this person talking to me? They're just trying to use me for X, Y, Z. So really it's more about you know, genuine connection. I'm genuinely curious about what you do or I'm genuinely passionate about this field. Can you tell me more? So it is you know, give and take. So you know, someone offers you information, you're gonna try and give them and reciprocate information when you can too. And this is important, it's not just for extroverts. 
and this is the second thing that you know hear from students is like I'm just not extroverted. I don't want to be out and about talking to people. You know, it's shy. Um, but actually, some of the most successful networkers tend to be introverts. You guys know why? It's calm studies people. Why would introverts? Yeah. Because they listen more. Yeah? Yes, because they listen. Um, they tend to do listening first, talking second. And when you're developing a relationship, you're trying to get as much information about the other so that you can connect on a commonality. So listening is actually just the main um, part of developing these relationships. So yeah, it's about listening. You eventually have to talk. You can't just listen and stare at someone. But at least, you know, introverts <coughs> can go there naturally. So what do you think extroverts do well, though, in networking? Market themselves. Market themselves, and they work that room. I mean, they will go and talk. Well, I talked to 100 people today. It was awesome, you know. And it was like I talked to three. It is very meaningful, you know. And vote. <laughs> good, right? Because it's suiting your personality. And it's just to remember what your personality is like. Now, the, the second part is, um, you know, the in-person is powerful, but it does take time to require follow-up. So the extrovert pro pro usually has problems with, I talked to 100 people, and now I can't remember who, what I said to who, and I have to follow up with 100 people, and it's overwhelming, whereas the person who talked to three is like, oh, I have three emails to send, okay. You know, so again, managing your expectations of how you want to follow up with people is just as important, right? And again, polite, friendly, professional, definitely not a gossip <coughs> session. We're wanting to focus on the positive aspects. So again, that whole bad mouthing your employer, that type of thing, you want to keep that out of your networking practices. Right? Especially in Silicon Valley, this is a really small valley. People know each other, they've worked at all these different companies. So when you're meeting someone new and you don't quite know where you stand with them, it's best to keep it pretty neutral because it can spiral pretty quickly. Okay. Again, you guys probably already know this. this is Theory. Um, first impressions, so important. So, you know, how how long does a person have before someone else makes an assumption about them in, in their first meeting? In about seven seconds, someone has made a first impression about you. Seven seconds, okay. Um, doesn't mean you can't change that impression, but when they first meet someone, within seven seconds, their brain will say, like, not like, positive, not like. There's something that they start associating. Um, because they're trying to identify, again, where do we connect. Okay, so there's been lots and lots of research done on this, but every face-to-face -face contact has three components. Verbal, what's said, what's actually the content. Vocal, how you say it. And then visual, what is it that you're presenting, the nonverbals. So of the three things, what do you think people focus on most? What you say, your words, how you say it, your tone of voice, or your body language? Body language. Yeah. I would expect that from you guys. But I mean, if you look at percentage and breakdowns, that's quite significant. So almost, you know, more than half of what someone actually attunes to is nonverbals. What you look like, how you're standing, are you smiling, all of those things connect right away with someone. The second piece is how you're saying it. What's kind of scary is what you said, I may or may not So. I'm lucky if you guys retain maybe you know ten percent of what I said today, but you might remember. Oh, I remember what she's wearing, and oh yeah, I remember how she said something, or you know how she engaged us. But I'm hoping that you retain more than ten percent. But you know what I'm saying may not necessarily be the first thing that you're connecting. But that being said, when you meet someone for the first time, it's really about your body language, okay, how you're presenting yourself. And a lot of times we don't even know what our body language is. So at the Career Center, we do a lot of um, mock interviewing. So when you're getting ready for an interview, and we'll actually sit with you, and we'll do a, a mock pretend interview, and we give you feedback on how you answer the questions. And one of the categories is <coughs> nonverbals. Did you make eye contact? Did you know that your foot taps when you get nervous? Maybe I did that. You know, um, you, did you know that you rolled your eyes twice? Did you know? So some of those things that we're not aware of, um, but definitely make an impression on someone. So the first thing you want to do before you go to an event or you're going to meet with someone is um, preparation. And definitely, you want to have a goal. Because people are going to ask you what brought you to this event, why are you here, or what are you looking for. So knowing what your goal is is really important. I'm looking for a marketing internship. I'm looking for an entry-level position. I'd love to get in with Apple. You know, what is that goal? And then use your social networks for research. 
Um, a good tip is when you go to a professional association meeting, you know, Googling the speaker and the people who are on the, on the planning committee, great thing to do. You get back <coughs> on who they are, what they're interested in, so when you meet them for the first time or you go up to them, you already have something that you can talk about that's common. Um, LinkedIn, if you know that you're going to go to an event and you want to um, connect with someone, you can even send them a message ahead of time saying, I'm going to be at XYZ event, I'd love to connect with you at that event, um, and here's a little bit about what I'm excited to, you know, to hear about in that presentation. But that already gives that person a heads up of who you are and maybe even to look out for you, okay? First impressions, the nonverbals, also what you wear, okay? So looking like a professional, dressing professional when you are going to events um, is important. Um, if it's just something casual where it's like drinks, you know, for the Alumni Association, they have networking mixers all the time, yeah, you probably don't necessarily have to come in a suit, but you're not going to come in flip-flops either, right? Because again, what is that impression that you want people to take away from Now, the next one is really having some materials, marketing materials with you. You're not going to walk around with your resume for these things and start <laughs> handing out your resume everywhere, but people are going to want to follow up with you or know how to contact you. They're probably not going to remember your name. So um, even if you have your name tag on, I don't, I don't know how many people actually remember the names of people they met with. So having a business card, is, as a student, you can have your own business card. Some of you may have even graphic background and interest in creating business cards, which is something with your name, your major, or maybe what your goal is, and then uh, your contact information. Okay. And then the most important thing is attitude. Again, that's back to the, the nonverbal piece, but people are really drawn to people that seem happy and content. Okay, if you're the person in the corner that's really nervous and you're kind of like, and you're not, you know, connecting, there's not really an impetus to want to go over and connect with you. Okay, that being said, we're going to talk about using the people who stand by themselves as a strategy of how to, to talk to people when you go to, to an event. But positive attitude goes a long way. Okay, just looking like you're generally a nice person to approach is. Part of, part of the battle for networking, okay? Uh, what do you say, your introduction? Again, just tailoring your pitch, just like you would your resume, you know, why are you at the event, what is it that you're specifically looking for? Um, again, include your name. People are, you know, are gonna wanna know who you are, if you're with an organization, what organization you're with, if you're from school, what your major is, and then how you're connected with the event. Do, keep it short, 10 to 20 seconds, doesn't have to be, you know, this major speech. Um, again, name tag's important, make sure it's le legible. I can't tell you how many times, we're having an upcoming uh, job fair, and students will write their names, and I, I cannot just decide what is the key feature about them, and then I'll either try to connect with them on LinkedIn or send a quick, quick email saying it's so nice to meet them and really appreciated their insight about XYZ, and then if I have like an article or a resource that's related, I'll just include that. Okay. The other thing is, well, what on earth do I say? I don't really worry about that with you guys, but just in case, you know, humor helps, keep it light. It could be as simple as, do you know the speaker? Have you heard of the speaker before? Is this your first event? What brings you to this meeting? Um, I recently joined the association. How long have you been a member? That's a good one, too. And then if you're really stuck, like, comments about the venue, traffic, parking, the weather, I mean, anything to kind of just get stuff started. Uh, the or method's really good, kind of come into the room, observe what's going on, who's talking to who, what's the, the flow look like, then ask a question, and then reveal something about yourself. <coughs> um, the other piece is, if there's a food table, that's usually a safe place to start. People are waiting in line for food, you can easily talk to the other person about, oh, that looks good, or, you know, what brings you to this event? So that's a, a safe place. The other thing is, if you see someone who's alone, they do not want to be by themselves. No one wants to be person alone by themselves. So going up to the person who doesn't have anyone to talk to and starting a conversation with them, great way to start. So you help them out, they don't feel like they're alone in a room, and you're also not the person who's kind of lost and not knowing where to talk or who to talk to. So do you guys have any tips on how you break the ice? Making that work? Yeah? Smile. Okay, smile huge. That's a good one. Okay. Any topics you should avoid? Sex, politics, religion. Yeah. yeah. The non neutrals, right? Okay, and here are my two keys to networking. 
Sincerity. No one questions what his intention is. He just wants to love you. <laughs> and listening, right? And we talked about the importance of listening earlier. But if you just remember those two things, even if you get stumped up, and this applies to a job fair or anything where you're kind of introducing yourself to someone and you get nervous, <coughs> if you really sincerely say, you know, I'm just curious to learn more about this because I am passionate about X, Y, Z, and you say that with a lot of sincerity, people are going to want to help you out. Um, and then when they give you feedback or someone's asking you for something, making sure that they feel attuned to that you're making eye contact with them and that you're genuinely listening to what they have to say. But I mean, this is, the, this is true for all forms of communication, right? Kind of basic Okay, so final tips and strategies. <clears throat> have a tip, I um, mean, have a purpose um, or a role with the event. I think this is really important if it's your first event. You can volunteer to be the greeter. Greeters are a really good one because you get to meet everyone and you have a purpose of talking to them and handing out like information. Uh, be the help on planning or be a note taker. So again, you have a purpose, you have something to do and you don't feel like you're just kind of floating around. Don't do it alone. If you're really nervous about something, go with a friend. Um, and that definitely helps, but be sure that you're not just talking to that one person and that you kind of break apart and meet other people. We talked about the person who's standing alone. Uh, definitely take some notes on the business cards so that you can remember what to follow up about. Deliver on your promises. If you tell someone you're going to follow up with them on a job lead or that you know someone who might be a good intern, be sure that you send that information to them because, again, this is your first introduction and what you don't want them to remember is that you're like, what you want them to remember is like, wow, this person really helped me out. And then don't feel overwhelmed by volume. Again, the quality of, of your contacts is what's most important. And if you still don't want to meet someone, talk about all these great resources and starting with social networking first and then maybe inviting someone to call you and just doing it one-on-one that way. And then just some resources that might be helpful for you. Um, really low-cost, cool um, site for making your own creative business cards. Moo.com, has anyone used them before? Yeah, okay. Um, this mobile app is really good. Cardmunch.com, so if you are at an event and you um, are getting all these business cards, you can use this mobile app, take a picture of the person's card, and it'll automatically send them an invite to your LinkedIn. That's Super awesome. Um, again, check out professional associations in your field of interest, and you can also use meetup.com. Has anyone used meetup to like connect with yeah. For those of you who have used Meetup, has it been a positive experience? Yeah, there sort of depends on your interest. There's all kinds of meetings in the Bay Area yeah. for deep technical and broad social. Yeah, so it's a really great um, resource if you just want to find a niche area of people who are like-minded and start your networking that way. We already talked about LinkedIn. Um, you know, Google groups and Yahoo groups are still viable areas to kind of connect with people, and then absolutely along that. So I made it within time. Um, th those are just the basic tips to kind of start thinking about your networking pieces. I do want to say that there are some next steps if you want to think about what you want to do next. <coughs> and I'll just leave them up here. The other thing is you can start practicing some of this soon. So we do have some upcoming events. We have a job fair coming at March 6th. So I have some flyers here if you want to see the employers that are coming, but they're actively recruiting for interns and full-time positions. So if you do want to see them working to use, this is a great event to do that. Do you want to answer now? Oh, sure. Or, they are. Okay. And then, how many of you are interested in a global career or working international? Okay. So there's, uh, have you heard of the Global Career Day? That's coming up as well. It's a forum talking about careers abroad and how to work abroad and some of the trends of working abroad. And so I have some flyers for that. That's in April. Sure. And then any other of our workshops or if you want specific advising, if you want someone to review your LinkedIn profile, you can make appointments for that with us. And so all of our contact information is here in our calendar as well. Okay? So thank you for having me. Uh, I expect to see a lot more LinkedIn requests. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. Um, 